Isaac Arthur is a physicist and award-winning science communicator. He's host of the almost 700,000 subscriber strong YouTube channel, Science and Futurism with Isaac Arthur. His channel focuses on topics including futuristic megastructures, space colonization, and aliens. In the words of Isaac, you're gonna to wanna to grab a drink and a snack for this one. So Isaac, tell me a little bit about your life before YouTube and about your YouTube channel. Oh, well, I got started uh, some time back in 1980, and uh, I had a pretty geeky, geeky upbringing. My parents were met when they were physics majors, so I was kind of doomed from the get-go to grow up on Star Trek and Doctor Who. Uh, and uh, <laughs> so when I was 16, I went to college for physics. I graduated when I was 20, stuck around for a couple of years of grad school, ran off and enlisted in the Army, and I was a sergeant during Operation Iraqi Freedom down in Ramadi and Telefal. And when I got out of that, I thought, well, maybe it's time to go back and finish up my doctorate. And I thought, no, I don't want to do that. So <laughs> I went into kind of civil government for a couple of years, and I was missing the science stuff a lot. I was, you know, this really wasn't there. So I've been hanging out on a lot of geekier forums with sci-fi authors and things like that, discussing more realistic options for, you know, how, how the future might roll out. And I just ended up doing a video that was kind of discussing a lot of things I, I often talk to them about anyway. But so I just would have to repeat myself over and again. And uh, like a week or two after that came out, so I posted it to YouTube. And it says, you get an email, it says, you have a subscriber. I said, what's a subscriber? <laughs> so <laughs> a couple months later, I did another episode. And a couple months later, I did another episode. And, and, and then about a year later, it became a weekly thing that I've been doing for, what, almost eight years now. So it's, yeah. it's, we do science and futurism on pretty much any topic that takes our whim. Uh, we try to keep the realism, the actual science part, hard as we can, but we freely play around with science fiction. It makes for good examples and inspires good thoughts on things. So, and we just try to have fun with it while keeping it uh, as informative. We seek as you know, kind of sneak a little bit of education there where we can, and just try to make it entertaining. Yeah, well, well, you do. I think it's great, and you have this really fun balance between, like you say, kind of speculation and realism. Mm -hmm. um, it's kind of like it, it's realistic in. 5,000 years or in 50,000 years or in 50 years, you know, like th there's kind of these different levels, but yeah, it's so much fun. How do you come up with the ideas for all the videos? Uh, I mean, it, it is all over the place. Uh, sometimes someone will just email me a, uh, sometimes someone will just email me a suggested episode and I will go ahead and do that episode. Uh, sometimes we all do a poll of the audience, see what they feel like. Sometimes I'll be watching old classic sci-fi or reading a book. And I was like, you know what? I want to do that episode or yeah. I try to stay away from current events in science because I have like a three month lag time on making episodes. So, also, I really I don't like to chase after the newest crazy, you know, uh, fad of science, which happens a lot as to what's the new popular thing. I mm -hmm. try to wait and collect data and information. So, the brand new discovery, which according to Betteridge's law, is usually going to turn out to be false anyway. As I say, any newspaper headline that ends with a question mark, the answer is always going to be no. And that. <laughs> That turns out to be the case so often with a lot of the science stuff, you know, they get a little bit messed up. They'll say something like, well, black hole discovered in lab, created in lab by physicists. And it's like, no, they, they found a material that was always one frequency of light completely. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but, you know, the, the extra time lets us, you know, take our time to kind of absorb a topic and give it a, a real proper going through. We don't go for the three minute pop video, the clickbait ones, you know, the title is exactly what it is, no matter how crazy it is even colonizing the sun, which was done as a bet. <laughs> <laughs> and we try to go into proper details. It's not just a three minute whack, like some things are, which is yeah. fine as its own you know, genre, but not what we aim for. Yeah. And I, I just watched, or I didn't quite finish it yet, but your compendium of like all the uh, mega structures. And there was so many, like so <laughs> many different ones in there. It was incredible. Well, it's the first episode I ever used the chaptering feature of YouTube on. Oh, I, yeah. you know, I know about four, and, and the funny thing was when I, I just put like the initial 30 in because I got lazy, I just want to space them out. And then I said, if anyone wants to put together a whole list, I'll put them on there. And I, so somebody did, and I pasted it in there and it wouldn't load me up. And that's how I found out uh, that they actually have a limit of 100 entries on there. We had 101, and it took me about 30 minutes of changing the numbers around to find out which one I had to cut out so we actually hit it. We were exactly one too many for the chapter. So <laughs> well, I never knew that, and, and I guess I never would have found out if it wasn't for this. I don't think very many people would. <laughs> that's a two-hour video. You, you, you just discovered the Easter egg mm -hmm. in YouTube there. Um, so out of all the, the hundreds, probably, probably a few hundred videos you've made now, do you have a favorite or favorites 
Um, I think that one maybe in a way it was it was quite a lot of work to do because it was like four times longer than the average. And uh, it was the first one we had a co-narrator on that. I got to do that one with my wife because yeah. I knew I couldn't have recorded all that in one shot. I thought it'd be <laughs> nice to alternate entries. Uh, so that's a current cool favorite. Um, I always like the Civilizations at the End of Time episodes. That's all fun because they're actually some of the most popular episodes, but I'd originally done the first one uh, as kind of a uh, follow-up on six other episodes as a kind of you know summation of ideas that I didn't think very many people were going to watch. Ironically, most people watch that one and don't see the, the preliminary ones. You kind of need to understand the episode, but they seem to enjoy it. Um, but that was a fun one just because it, it's – Let's not look at the future in 10 years or 100 years or 1,000 years or 1 million years. Let's look at the future in a trillion, 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 trillion <laughs> years. And, see, you know, and is there such a thing? And, you know, is there is there room for civilization after all the stars are gone? And it's really kind of surprising that it turns out the answer is is actually probably yes. So Yeah, that's hard to get the head around though, right? It's hard yeah, to comprehend right. that stuff. One of the numbers on it was kind of like, you think it's going to be some kind of little trickle of civilization, but if you get to do that, that cold computing efficiency angle, it actually turns out to be a, a brighter civilization, so to speak, than doing the stellar phase, wow. which ends up being like this kind of short, explosive epoch of what would probably be a much longer, bigger civilization after yeah. all the stars was born out. It's like, that's wow. not expected, but that, that yeah. happens so much when we, but what is intuitive, right? What is common sense? so often isn't you know when you start time you change these big paradigm shifts in science and it's like wow i did not see that coming it's the henry ford thing about you know you're expecting people to want a faster horse not a car yeah they see the car and they say wow that changes everything you know yeah yeah wow that's or or a quadcopter (laughs) yeah yeah but no i got you um okay well let's let's kind of move into space a little bit so what's your we've done your favorite video but let's do your favorite uh have you got a favorite non-earth planet a favorite non-Earth planet, um, hmm. uh, you know, either Pluto or Neptune. I, I really enjoy doing it. We, we've basically done a colonization episode for every single planet except for the one between Saturn and Neptune because I try not to do episodes. I think I would be like, giggling the entire time while doing the narration. <laughs> uh, and uh, I'd say colonizing Neptune, which is almost identical to Uranus, um, and colonizing Pluto were my two favorite ones to do because – they are such a – you do not expect there to be civilizations around those. Yeah. Uh, and so it was a lot of fun to actually kind of show how you could do some really neat ones. I think with Pluto, because it has a tidally locked planet-to-moon combination, the same face is showing towards each other all the time, not like with our own moon where it shows us the same face but always rotates. Mm-hmm. So you can stretch a line right between those, and they have almost a perfectly circular orbit. A yeah. space elevator does not need to be strong there. You can just build a bridge physically connecting those two. Yeah, it just I'm, permanently there. <laughs> I'm I'm fascinated by Pluto as well. I think it's so yeah. awesome. I kind of like to imagine myself stood on it and seeing this massive yeah. moon because they're so close and so oh, similar yeah. in size, right? And, and and you know, there's not that much gravity there anyway, so you're probably using spin gravity, and it, it looks like that bridge might be the place you end up living. But yeah. I love uh, it's Sharon. Is, the people wonder about that because yeah. the guy named it after his wife. Now the, the, the <laughs> Greek god is Chiron, but. Um, so on Sharon, we could try to name all the features and we'd run out of planets. So, you know, we got Greek gods and things a long time ago. So it all got named after Tolkien stuff. So there's the giant oh. plains of Mordor on the northern side of Sharon. <laughs> well, I did not know that. It's yeah. so cool. <laughs> <laughs> and it's, it's black there because, not from lack of light, it's black there because Pluto has cryovolcanoes that spit material out and it's so low gravity they get in orbit. And they fall on that part of Kai, uh, Sherman. Wow. So, yeah, in Mordor. <laughs> yeah, in Mordor. <laughs> perfect. That is perfect. But yeah, I'm, I'm agreed on Pluto. A big, big fan. Um, it should be a planet, right? We should, we should just call oh, it a planet. I like to call it. Well, the thing I always remind folks on this is we discovered so many plants that are some of them even bigger than Pluto in that period between when we demoted it and the end of late. There was like a dozen plants that are in the Pluto class range. And say these are plants. We just call them a dwarf plant. Seems we have a giant plant. We have four giant planets. Those are still plants. They're just giant. It's yeah. dwarfs. You know, yeah. our sun is a yellow dwarf. It's still a star. We have a million minor planets in the solar system. And I think, I think to keep in mind is in 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 times to come, it's going to be a pain in the butt to memorize the dozens of dwarf planets we come up with. So maybe Pluto should be that first sacrifice if you have to memorize more. But you're going to have to memorize more anyway because, you know. I, I go and I colonize some rock that's 100 kilometers across. That's tiny, right? And yet yeah. at the same time, that probably be one of the thousand biggest objects in the solar system. 
you can build a pretty big civilization there. You can build like a, a billion person nation state on that thing. And they're not going to be like, oh, you're not a planet. It's like, well, <laughs> we, we, we all, <laughs> we will might a planet maybe, but we're pretty big. <laughs> Because yeah. the Roman Empire was, we, we <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and there definitely. are a million of those places in all you know solar system, and I suspect they will all want to be called a ward or a planet or something along those lines. Yeah, and and maybe moons too should should get that that yeah. that same status. Um, let's move outside the solar system briefly. Um, exoplanets. I mm-hmm. believe I heard you say that there are in, in another video somewhere that there are around ten billion exoplanets in the habitable zone in their kind of Goldilocks region where it's you know not too, hard, not too cold yeah. i mean 10 probably billion is more. kind of the lower end figure on that though we would say there's probably several trillion planets in the galaxy just because the you know if you figure in 10 per star ish area mm. um and then if you assume if you assume that one in 10 of them has something in the mars venus or earth mass range that's somewhere in that zone between venus and mars in terms of habitability i mean that's that's not a lot one in 10 even that's 100 then you're still looking at billions of these things in, in you know, of these available. So 10 billion would be kind of your low end figure for yeah. what we say is much more easy to terraform than Mars or Venus. Wow. You know? Yeah. That is wild, isn't it? It's like a yeah. pretty much incomprehensible number. Um, I mean, what do you think in terms of like how many of those are going to have life? There must be a, quite a chunk. And obviously into anywhere from micro like, bacteria. Yeah. Up, yeah, yeah, basically. Um, <laughs> but but it would seem like, you know, there must be quite a chunk out there with at least I, like microbial life, right? I still would not be surprised if we found life in the solar system off Earth, either yeah. sharing an origin or even separately originated. Yeah. Um, on the other hand, I wouldn't be surprised if we didn't find any in the entire galaxy either. So it's a very, very wide margin of error there. <laughs> yeah. It's intelligent life, um, and I mean technological life, I should say. It's technological life that I think is probably very rare in the galaxy. But um, where that where that change of what is, whether it's, it's it's just a dead galaxy, because we have no idea what the odds of life for me are. I've seen people play around with numbers on that. But yeah. like the one I saw that people have been quoting for a long time, talked about the odds of something randomly forming on Earth. And it was a paper that's still out there 20 years later. And the first thing I noticed I was reading through it as a physicist was the, the amount of water on Earth off by three orders of magnitude. <laughs> and I say, this is the most serious estimate people have on this, and they are a thousand times high on their water value for the planet. No one's done a very good look at this. So we have no idea what the odds are. And I, so I yeah. asked some friends who are a little bit more serious in the mathematical biology and things like, we have no clue. You yeah. know, it, it's almost as wide a margin of error as it is for the. Uh, the strength of vacuum energy, where it's 120 orders of magnitude between the uh, ex- you know, experimental data and the theoretical prediction. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we're uh, shooting it in the could dark. be that life is one of those things that is so stupefyingly rare to start in the first place that we're it for the universe. Yeah. Or it could be one of those things where it's so insanely common that you're going to find it on every rock. Yeah. So. Yeah, I, I, I can't to wait to find out more. Mind. Yeah, <laughs> with with hopefully with James Webb, we're going to find out more. I, yeah. Funnily, Pascal Lee, he uh, he agrees with you. Why? Obviously, you don't have an opinion on it. Actually, you said the range, but he he thinks there's a pretty solid chance that we're going to find like microbial life on Mars, um, and and potentially you know life, some kind of life in the oceans on Europa and things like that. I went out on a limb and I said I'm gonna I'm gonna say my prediction is there's some kind of big fish in in, in Europa's uh, <laughs> it oceans. Would be if, it was. If, <laughs> if there's not, there will be another century or two because we'll go plan it. So if, if yeah. you're looking for alien life, you know, and if we don't find it in the galaxy, be patient, wait a few thousand years because you know you got divergence you know you've got people living under an alien sun on an alien planet they're not going to look too much like us for too long even if you ignore things like cybernetics and genetic engineering but at the same time i mean people say well it seems like there's a lot more plants than people said when i was young or things like that people are much more about it with alien life and say well the planetary predictions people are assuming pretty much my entire lifetime it was going to be somewhere between almost every system to no less than one percent that would have like an earth-ish planet uh, and then at the same time, I said, well, how often life be? And I would say on that one, a lot of scientists were really hesitant to say that it could be very common because they are worried they were going to get, you know, point at their fingers, you mm. tin for a hat thing. But I'm, I'm yeah. glad to see that going away. Nobody really knows the odds. And I think they were making it seem, in some cases, they were so hesitant to say there could be alien life out there that they were just depressing the implied number. So now it sounds surprising when it really is almost the same prediction it really was 50 or 60 years ago mm. you know this is the odds of a planet being that area to within an order of magnitude what are the odds that has life on it 
somewhere yeah. between zero and one. <laughs> yeah, until we find it, yeah, we're just basing it off. That we're here, so yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, and I guess two of the most interesting are, well, for me at least, the Tea Garden B, Tea Garden Star B, mm -hmm. and the the Proxima Century B as well. Because like, yeah. they're two of the closest, right? And and they're two that we probably could realistically will find out more about their atmosphere in the next couple of years, I would imagine. Or at least in our so. lifetimes, so. Um, for sure, I would expect. Um, we had just gotten some of that data when I was doing our episode on colonizing Alpha Centauri. And it, it, about half the episodes, they told us looking at that, just that Fox Bay area, because yeah. it hadn't been what the episode was meant to be about. Ironically, it's our most popular episode, too. But just because that had come out, we, we got I focused in on writing on, on Fox Spot and... You know, that is a place that we could very realistically expect to find habitable worlds at. Yeah. And again, what is habitable? You talked about if you can send a, a starship to another solar system and keep people alive on it for 100 years, and you already talk about things like Mars or Venus's options, what qualifies as a habitable planet is a much wider category. Mm -hmm. You're probably never going to find one you could land on and not die on without having yeah, to Yeah, just hop them. out. Have a you know? <laughs> oh, each was so pretty here. It's like, well... <laughs> Yeah, you know, <laughs> that wants to eat you. That would have probably die if it did. You know, <laughs> doesn't yeah. matter what to kill you. That wants to just kill you. Your space is hostile. Earth is a very rough place to live as is, uh, and it's the most friendly place in the gigantic universe for us. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, definitely. And yeah, it's like you said. It's so it's so cool to me that we only found out about Proxima Century B like what was it six years ago or something like that. Now, yeah, like four, or five, six, and maybe yeah, it might have been as last six. Well, yeah, we're living in an <laughs> exciting time. Um, I think it was one of our mid range episodes that happened around you know after we got our feet underneath us, but that actually would have been about six years ago. So yeah, <laughs> yeah, well. It's, 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 it does fly but at the same time it's so recent um yeah. in terms of earth and in terms of futurism um and in terms of the future tell me if uh, like on our current trajectory the way things are going currently with you know who's in power i'm not going to name any names but the kind of people that are in power the kind of the way our governments and corporations handle themselves and things like that how do you kind of realistically see our future on earth playing out how do you how do you see that going there's there's always two kind of pathways to go on this and it's like yeah the, the changing flavor on this is is you, you i will you, just for the record i will ask you kind of what you would do with it after just like so okay. so you don't have to go down that road for now but i want yeah. i want the kind of more yeah what how you think it will go i guess with technology there's the possibility that it might become ridiculously easy for any individual person to make a doomsday device and very hard to detect it that's a future where you need to get your, your eggs scattered around out of one basket very quickly, and it still might not save you. It's not like somebody can't build a doomsday device on your colony planet, too. That that future, that late filter of, of basically technological time bombs, uh, which is an episode coming up in a month or two, uh, that is one that, you know, that has nothing to do with people's personalities. Right? Then there's another one that is more optimistic, because we just don't know what it's going to be yet. We don't know what that technology level is. Where we say, well, we've gotten really good at treating mental illness. You know, psychology is a science too, albeit a very mm -hmm. new and one that needs a lot of improvement. But we're very good at detecting these things. We're very good at treating these things a hundred years from now. Then you don't have to worry about what some crazy maniac would do, even if they had doomsday devices. And the, it could also just be the the humanity as a whole is just we survived a lot of crises. You know, we are pretty sturdy. Um, we've got all mixture of saints and sinners across the board. I tend to. Find Follow the idea that the future of humanity is not one of hugs and kisses or infinite war. It's just what it is now, but with, you know, nice old iPhones. Yeah, <laughs> so yeah, yeah. <laughs> how long that goes on, I don't know, but probably for another couple thousand years. I don't think a technological singularity is going to pop up and wipe us out uh, in the next 10 years or something like that. That's, yeah. you know, I think that we're going to see a lot more of, I don't want to say the ordinary and the mundane, but on the one hand, if you live a century ago, Things are so much different nowadays, but they're also mm. not. Yeah, and I think yeah. that's a lot of what we expect of the future. Yeah, but okay. we won't really know until we see how the technology really develops. Because if you can't make a doomsday device in your basement for a couple of bucks in a three D printer, this planet will get built up very quickly. You know? Yeah, yeah, that would, that would be a scary, a scary future. In terms of the climate and stuff, do you think um, do you think we're going to be able to sort that out? Do you think they will sort that out? I mean, obviously we some... can, but do you think we will? I guess is the bigger question. I, I do. Um, you know, one thing that comes up a lot of people say, well, when we wreck this planet, we'll go immigrate to Mars. Or people will try to do that. I was like, no, you could nuke this planet till it was covered in glass and had no atmosphere or ocean left. And it would still be easier to retail from it 
that a tail form models of Venus or mm. any other planet you like to come across. Interesting. Yeah. Uh, all the technology you need to make it a go on a space habitat or a new planet uh, is the same technology you need to repair this one, only harder. Yeah. So we have options available on these. They are more extreme in some cases, but a lot of it is people just haven't fully embraced the need or necessity yet, and they don't like some of the pathways forward, which in some cases is valid. We got yeah. options like solar shades if we get a moon base running that would be expensive now, but are an easy fix if you get a, get a moon base running that can pop out aluminum foil, done. It's like that. Yeah. Um, same for fusion. Same for someone coming up with a battery that's as fuel dense as you know ethanol or oil is right now, as opposed to all oh, lithium batteries are about a tenth as uh, energy dense. They're pain, and they don't really charge or fill fast. A better battery, uh, one that stores more cheaply, so we can do solar easier. A better, cheaper solar panel that's you know you know more durable, just cheap to spew out. Any one of those technologies shifts the parameters a lot. And I, we're definitely making progress there. One of our biggest problems right now is that we did, you know, so much with coal and oil and fossil fuels that we've gotten so good with those technologies. You know, we have perfected them. They are hyper-efficient. They have a century of massive research and development to make them more efficient. And a lot of our other ones, they need some time to catch up. And they're doing that in a competing environment. Yeah. So we've got lots of options. And they're also, sadly, competing with each other because not just can I make a better solar panel, our solar panels are so much better than they were a couple of decades ago, let alone 40 years ago on a calculator. It's yeah. that we keep improving everything else at the same time, so it raises a little bit of that competition level. But yeah. just the fact that we do keep improving this stuff tends to make me pretty optimistic about it. So, I read something the other day about China. I think they want to they want to put like a solar um, factory or a solar power plant in space. Um, I don't know. I don't. I didn't see any dates. I don't know when. They're, I don't know when that's going to be active. But I, yeah. I would love to see that. But I. This is well. China has a tendency to put out articles and all sorts of stuff. Yeah, that yeah. People come out and say, "Well, they're going to do this." And I, I, as I understand, and I could be wrong. I might. My show was banned there. Um, they <laughs> basically they have science reviews like any other place do, just like our pop science journals. And much as we get these very outrageous science articles coming out that pop up in like popular science of other plays, they have those too. Only yeah. they go straight out through their official you know, media source because that's all their media. So they pop out something like, oh, yes, we'll have a space elevator built by next year or to the <laughs> And I, I don't think that's really an official government stance just so much as, you know, that is the equivalent of all less peer reviewed uh, popular science magazines. How soon do you think we would we might start to see like a, or how soon do you think we might see our first kind of attempt at a breakaway civilization, whether it be a handful of people, at a private corporation that will think, well, I'm sick of this here. We're going to go or a small country. Or, I don't know. Like, I, I don't know how I see it happening. How do you see it happening and when? Seastead, probably. Um, I mean, it, if we're talking about off planets, that's at least a century off. But uh, if not more, but I'd say yeah. we probably see a lot of experiment. We, I mean, we always see some experimentation with micro nations and small sovereign island nations going back to well before this century. Um, but we see a lot of things playing with that, but there's a lot of pressure against that too. Yeah. Um, you know, usually it's essentially a tax haven or an experiment. And that tends to, that tends to end up changing with time because people will say things like, well, I love our colony of, you know, 200 people being its own sovereign nation, but no other nation takes us seriously in any way because they outnumber us a million to one. Um, and uh, we don't have, we got a judge. He's part time. Yeah. We don't have an appeals court. <laughs> we don't, we got two lawyers. They represent everybody. Um, we have a doctor who is the surgeon and everything else. You know, there's this, you, there are advantages to being part of a larger civilization and yeah. disadvantages too, but when you are a billion miles from home on some little asteroid or moon, yeah. those advantages, you say, well, they, they're far away. They don't understand our problems. No, they're not. Well, we, we are 20 minutes of signal lag away. And, you know, until this last century of telephones, that would be a fast communication. They're not far away from your problems and listen to you, but they do have a ton of resources and they can do something like, hey, we got hit by an asteroid and we don't have the resource to bail ourselves out and throw a billion dollars of spaceships out to help you out for purposes like that so yeah i think what you'd actually see is probably a lot of places saying things like we'd like to be our own independent chartered municipality you know like a village of a couple hundred people a couple thousand people like we have here and that might go to be a city or say well we'd like to be a county you know mm. or even we'd like to be a province a prefecture the new state the uh the you know 
99th state of the United States composed of 500 O'Neill soldiers that have, have networked together say, we are the state of O'Neill. You know, mm-hmm. that's very likely to be the case or something like that. Or this O'Neill soldier says, well, we'd like to be part of the state of Wyoming. We'd like to be a county of Wyoming, yeah. even though yeah. they're opening the moon. Got and it, what's yeah. cool about space habitats is you can move them too. So if you don't like your neighbors, they're pretty much automatically spaceships. You just take off and leave. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We don't like yeah. the court governor. We're going to go ahead and move to Colorado or Texas. You know? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, so back to the the future of us here on mm-hmm. on Earth. In in a couple of kind of bullet points, um, like what, the headlines, I suppose. If you were world king, right, you know, if you were like in charge of everything, what would you do now to secure our future here long term and to keep it nice and friendly, so we don't have to live underground and and like terraform well, everything and all that kind of stuff. There are some nice options for the ground living in the future. <laughs> yeah, I bet there are. <laughs> um, I mean, I, I probably, I probably throw a lot of energy across the board, just trying to improve almost every single thing. Yeah. Uh, uh, on the R and D end of it, more than let's say the subsidy to roll it out, um, and just see what can we, you know, what can we just keep making better and better. I throw a lot at nuclear and solar right now. To be honest, those are the two. You know, and I don't mean that's the like fusion's nice. I think that is on the table, but uh, you know, there's only so much you can. Th- th- we have to basically build a new facility every time we make a change over that. It takes like a decade to get it funded and built. So that's mm-hmm. why fusion is slow. Uh, I'd love to see a lot more done with fission, with nuclear batteries and RTGs. I'd love to see a lot more solar and batteries, molten salt reactors. I tend to feel like your smart move is to go after everything. You know, yeah. you know, civilization is not really going to be hurt by throwing $100 billion a year into research on energy technology. Yeah. You can get a lot done with something like that, though you might be over flooding the market. Right? Throwing money at problems doesn't always fix them, but you're spraying around, you'll likely have at least one dot hit. But the ones I would probably focus on most would be, uh, would probably be solar batteries themselves and uh, molten salts as just a heat storage facility and... Mm, probably breeder reactors, nuclear breeder reactors, just to get those up and going, because that's such an abundant supply, whether it's thorium or uranium, you're just never going to run out of it in yeah. any timeline that is less than thousands of years. Yeah. That would probably be the big focus on that one. And yeah. maybe maybe more effort into wireless power transmission, because that is your other fallback if you don't want to try to use compact fuels like you know, either oil, or gasoline, or, or ethanol is can you can you actually send power directly to a vehicle while it's on the road? Can you just oh, have yeah. wireless charging on the road as it goes? Yeah. And that's an option too. Then the other one would be superconductors. You know, the more you get superconductors or magnetic shielding. But the thing is, there's so many of them, and you only need one or two to pan out marginally to, yeah. to shift the whole system. Yeah. And so you got dozens to throw resources at, and that would be probably the direction I would go is just to just hurl effort at it and probably try to make it as sexy to the populace as possible to go into energy research because yeah. our problem right now is for a couple of decades computers where we're throwing almost all our brains or space research like go work on rockets and that's great too obviously we need all that and we need to be able to walk and shoot public at the same time but very few people say i can't wait to go into you know, when they were a teenager or a kid i want to be a solar panel researcher when i grow up or, <laughs> yeah. i can't wait to study anodes and cathodes on batteries and say, well, you gotta sell that to folks. You know, maybe you're you're good. You know, talking to folks in Marvel comics movies and say, you need to make the you know whatever famous scientist that read Richards. He needs to be an energy specialist. Can you do that for us? <laughs> yeah, it's very true. That's spot yeah. on. Yeah, I agree. And and yeah, hopefully solar is gonna and the others. Hopefully solar is gonna we're gonna see big advancements. I hope in our life. I think we will. I mean, patience is the is hard at times like this, but it will pay off. I think that to me, it's it's not if it's when and what mm. so I, I i have great optimism on that general area so i appreciate the optimism because i'm a little bit of a pessimist yeah. <laughs> so, so i'm gonna just go with that um so to move away from that a little bit move away away from from earth um what did you, would you say is our future and again this is a super broad question but kind of go with it wherever you want take do what you want with this what is the future of human space travel and colonization off earth off planet patience the, the biggest thing on, on that is um the parts of humanity that are going to go out and colonize the galaxy barring the discovery of a warp engine have to be the ones that are, are patient long-range planners because you, you know it's not just that you might need a decade to build the spaceship and not including the fact that it's going to take a century to get there and your terraforming projects or even your habitat building projects 
you might be able to build an O'Neill cylinder in a couple of decades that's fully furnished, but you want to tell from a planet you're looking at centuries. You know? Yeah. And that's fast. That's almost so fast that the rate at which you're changing your planet would almost overheat it from all the excess heat being generated while you're changing the surface. Terraforming is inherently destructive, you know. Whatever that planet looks like when you start, it does it when it's done. Even just putting four kilometers of ocean down on top of a planet, or three kilometers like we have here on Earth, so average depth, right, would require it to be raining nonstop at like Noah's Ark levels mm. for decades. And if it was coming straight from space, all the, you know, like a comet hitting, you're thinking, oh, it's ice. Well, in the process of falling down, it's picking up so much kinetic energy that it would be hotter than like molten lead. Yeah. So, you know, <laughs> so you really have to do these things very, very patiently and slowly. Yeah. Know? Yeah, no, definitely. Um, to kind of specify then a little bit more and go like a little bit more detail, the, the moon, what mm -hmm. would you say is uh, going to be our future kind of relationship with the moon? Um, yeah, I don't want to, I could kind of speculate my own things, but no, what's your, what are your thoughts on, yeah, how, how are we going to handle the moon in say the next 10, 20, and then going towards a hundred and more years? I think we'll have a permanent base there somewhere between 10 to 20 years from now. I think, cause I, I don't think we're going to go back. Like, I'd not be surprised if somebody went back there, like China or the U.S. rushed to get to be like, "Hey, look, we're back here, right?" Mm -hmm. But to build a permanent base there is is pretty much the next step, right? Um, and I'd say that that's probably going to be our first, you know, actual permanent settlement, as it were. Although it, it'd probably be like Antarctica, where it, it's not a settlement. Big yeah. Water has been around for seventy years now, sixty years now, and it's still considered to be just an outpost, even though it's. Got yeah. hundreds of buildings, twelve hundred and fifty people in the summer, things like that. But you're not allowed to sell it. So and I think the same is true for the moon at the moment. So yeah. it might be that it's just an outpost that eventually becomes a settlement. Um, I think that that is definitely approaching. I think for those of us who grew up in the '80s and '90s, saying, "Well, when are we going back to the moon? Any day now, next year? Why is it taking so long?" You know, wow, it could be a whole five or six more years before there again. And it's like, "Oh, we're oh, still there." It's worth remembering there's no real reason to go back to the moon yet until you're ready to do it in a big fashion, you know? Yeah. So could we go back to the moon? Of course we could. Of course we could. It's, you know, we have the same technology we had then and then some. Yeah. We could do it cheaper and better than we did then. And then what? Yeah. Uh, until we stay there and there has to be a purpose. I, I like the idea of doing it to produce like solar shades, mirrors, and power transmitters in orbit. Uh, it's a great place to produce fuel to send things on to Mars. It's, you know, that's... That's the key is, and so it really becomes a question of how comfortable are we with sending spaceships back and forth between there? You know, is, is are we ready for SpaceX to be doing that on a regular mm -hmm. basis? Keep in mind that it's kind of a miracle we didn't have anyone die during the Apollo missions. Yeah. Um, and uh, we're not that much better at space travel. Um, and then what are we doing up there to pay for it all that makes it actually worth it in the eyes of the public, you know? Mm -hmm. and, and that could be a crash project or something like Solar Shades. Um, but until we're ready to do that, and that might just be slightly better automation with robots, slightly better remote control for robots, um, more control 3D printers, we need that next step that lets us actually set up production there, yeah. whether that's fuel or metal, whatever it is. And that's when you can really say it's time for a moon base. If you're not ready to really start it up, if you actually have a working model, then you can go and do it. Yeah. Because you know? we need some time just get set up and funded. When when would you say uh, this is a wild obviously speculation? But if you have a guess on a year or a, like an approximate year, not when we next get back there, not when we next step foot on it, but when we kind of do something there, whether it be like a mini research thing or mining, or whether it's my my kind of dream of like a little kind of for short term holidays, the uh, space astronomy, space observatory, sorry, um, space observatory. Um, but whatever it might be, when do you think we'll next? When when do you think we'll manage to uh, yeah do something there properly? Um, uh, probably 2100 would be my best guess on that one, just because it, it seems like it takes a, is it basically it's been a century to get to McMurdo from the first, you know, real base of any kind on Antarctica. And I would just tend to think that we can probably do that a little bit faster now, but at the same time, it, it just takes a lot of war. You know, same for like what you say for historical bases in terms mm -hmm. of uh, colonies. They, they start off small and they grow up over a few generations. And I just don't think we get the, you know, we. I, I just think there'd be a delay really involved with that. So I think if we talk about there being some significant permanent moon base that has people living there, being born there, walking there, that's that's probably several generations off, at least a few. You know, not, yeah. not a thing for the next 20 years, but more like the year 2100. Got you. 
Mars as well. I want to. So your thoughts on our future on Mars? Obviously, if you believe Elon will be there in in five to ten years, um, even pessimists say they'll probably be a human on Mars, stepping foot on Mars in the next kind of 15, 20 mm -hmm. years. Yeah. What are your thoughts on when we'll get there for the first time and then how our future is going to play out there? Mars differs from the moon mainly that you pretty much have to have a base with live humans on it from day one to do anything. Yeah. On the moon, we might actually find that in a lot of cases we can do almost all everything remotely. So there might only be a few dozen people there whose job is to go out there and fix the radio antenna and kick the robot when it stops working. Yeah. Um, because you, you know it's a one or two second time delay. Very few things really require that much of a high speed transmission. It's going to be almost exactly like here on Earth. Only the phone calls will have irritating long pauses. Mars is different. You, know, you got to have people there from day one. You could actually see a settlement there that's actually qualifies a real human settlement. Before we saw one on the Moon, even though the Moon would probably predate it in terms of having any sort of industrial base and actual active permanent facilities. Mm -hmm. But I do tend to think Moon first is the better idea. Are you going to give me a, a year for Mars when 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 we get there and stuff 2100. Like that? <laughs> <That's> <laughs> 20, yeah. What about when we first get boots on the moon? On, on Mars, sorry, on Mars. Um by 2050, but possibly possibly by 2030, you know. Yeah. I, I, people aren't just making these numbers up and you know, like must say something like I could maybe do it in seven, the next 10 years. They might be yeah. optimistic, but we have missions we could launch there. We have the option. We've been at, we've had viable Mars mission options since the 90s. Yeah, and it's mostly yeah. just, uh, you know, the radiation issue can be dealt with by just making the ship thicker, but that makes it more expensive. Twice as yeah. much shielding, you know, <laughs> but uh, it's it's available. And I think if you're willing to do it big, if we want to throw half a trillion dollars at it, then we could put people on Mars in, a, you know, I would say a few years, five or six years, so no point in doing a crash project faster than that. Uh, but um, you could do it on that time scale. But yeah. if you want to actually do it more economically, sanely, Patience is a fortune, and I'm going to say force boots on the ground in a year that starts with two zero three. Got you. Got you. I think that sounds fair enough. Yeah, yeah. Um, in terms of, we're getting a little bit more speculative now. But when when are we going to get? Because we must one day. When are we going to get boots on the ground of Europa? When is there going to be somebody uh, checking that? Um, out? It's it's on our top ten list for sure. Maybe in our top five. So I don't think we're that much further behind. Big problem with Europa is there's so much radiation right around mm. Jupiter. And you have that long trip to get out there too. So that is one of those ones where you're going to need a little bit more than just getting the Mars, but it's very much the same basic concept. So I think if you got a Mars base and a moon base, it's just a matter of scaling up a little bit more. And like it took us longer to get to the North Pole or the South Pole than it did to get to the Arctic Circle and Arctic Circle, you know, to get those zones, but not that much more. And it's mm -hmm. kind of the same concept. Same applies for almost any other place of interest is once you get that going, once you got the once you got the model in place, then repetition's not that hard, you know. Yeah. And I think that you know, I'd be very surprised if we hadn't landed on most of the major objects of interest this century. Yeah, with maybe an actual be human. before twenty one hundred. Yeah, it's it's exciting. Hopefully, I'm going to live uh, close to. Hopefully, I'll live to see some of that. Well, people be, always uh, ask me what technology in the future do I most look forward to being invented. You know, what's one's most important? Is it fusion? Is it AI? I say, well, it's it's life extension technology. Mm. That's what I want to see invented in my lifetime. Yeah, <laughs> it's it's like the which wish would you choose? Are, are more wishes? Because then with your life extension, you get to see all the other technologies yeah. come to fruition. Yeah, it's clever. Yeah, well, you can't ask me for an infinite wishes. All right, that I I wish you bring me a genie that will grant me that wish. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's, um, in terms of. Uh, like space stations and and mega structures and things like that. I know you could talk about that for like you know a full twenty four hours or more, um, as with all the rest Probably. of the stuff. To be fair, <laughs> but in a kind of in a nutshell, what's our future in say the next you know not going too far in advance, say in the next hundred hundred and fifty years sooner if you want. What's that going to be? I mean, in my mind, I'm picturing like maybe in. 50 to 100 years we're going to have a bunch of little iss kind of things going around some of them maybe hotels and things like that but what are your thoughts um you know with something like uh, a mars station you know you want to have artificial we don't we don't know how much gravity is enough if we go to the moon first and that's what 17 percent of normal gravity and everyone's fine there they live there and everything's good right uh then that that's great and we don't need to do anything special for any mars because gravity is twice high there uh, if it turns out that uh, the effect of living on some place like the moon for months at a time is very similar to zero gravity, maybe even worse, you know, we assume it would be easier, but it might be worse for all we know. Mm. Until we have hard data on what living in low gravity is like, it would be 
ethically irresponsible to send people to Mars. People talk about, well, you know, we've had folks living in space for over a year in zero gravity, et cetera, et cetera. It's like, well, we didn't have them living there for three years, right? And they didn't come back very healthy. And you got all that radiation on the way there, on the way back, and while you're down there, but there's also no gravity. We can't just send people there until we've seen what that effect is, which means either a permanent moon base or it means a rotating habitat that simulates Martian gravity, right? That's a pretty big object. It might be like a hammer hab or, a, you know, a ring station, wherever it is, still big. Uh, see all mega structures episode for discussion with all those all. Uh, that's a big investment. And people say, well, why don't we have this in space right now? I say, well, that's that's straightforward enough. We only have one place in the universe that we can do zero gravity research on, and that's that's the space station. So, if, you know, we like to research other things than just what the effect of low gravity on humans is. So we will get there. We'll be part of next one. Well, you know, not too far ahead, we'll have something that simulates probably Mars gravity being with. But beyond that. That's when we get the questions answered about how much gravity do we need. If it turns out Mars or moon gravity is fine, then you get a couple of space stations that have a, a, a you know, low gravity simulated ring uh, in the short term and everybody else lands on those planets. If it turns out that that's not enough, that you really do need you know, real gravity, then you see the big space habitats as the mainstay from the get-go. Yeah. Uh, either way... In the long term, we tend to assume most people will live on these artificial worlds for the same reason. Say, I like a cave. Caves are easy. Caves are cheap. But I can take a mountain that's got half a dozen caves in it the size of a small house and turn that into like a million stone houses that are bigger than the caves individually were. Yeah. That's the idea behind mega structures. The other thing is I like the fact that Mars has a 24-hour and 30-minute day. I'd much rather have one that had a 24-hour day exactly. Yeah. I'd like one that had temperatures exactly like they are on Earth climate exactly like what we'd like it to be on Earth. And yeah. if we didn't like it, we could actually tailor it to whatever we wanted, not just what we came across. And that includes more options you'd ever find on a planet too. Like, mm. I want to live in a habitat where the gravity has full atmospheric pressure and there is literally 1% normal gravity. You're not going to find a planet like that. But you could do that with a space habitat easy enough. You go fly around in your floating cities and, and winged people, you know? Yeah. Um, so this is the idea is that in the future we'll build more of these, but much as we don't really build a lot of skyscrapers because they're very expensive right now and they would have been impossibly expensive a century or two ago, these space habitats uh, of the larger scale, your neosonals, your big megastructures, that's not for this century. That's for earliest 22nd century. Yeah. I'd do you think, do you think we might get days. one then in that, in that next century? I don't know. Neosonal, quite probably. I mean, I think you... You know, they're nice because they're big, but I think your soda is designed for like 100,000 to a million people live on board. Um, you know, where something like a Kalpana, uh, those things you can build, and uh, you may, maybe you build 100 of them instead of one O'Neill cylinder because it gives you 100 different communities mm -hmm. with the same total resources and, and size. I think that you'd always see a lot more small habitats than big ones, but I think you see some big ones too. Yeah. Wow. Um, so again, in kind of like one or two like headlines, because again, these questions you could go forever, but yeah. what what will our space travel or, or colonization capabilities be in A, 100 years, B, 1,000 years, and C, 100,000 years? <laughs> I think by, by 100 years from now, we'll be able to get to any place in the solar system with a robotic probe cheaply, mm -hmm. and that we'll be able to get to any place we want to send a human if we really want to. Uh, we'll be able to get them to any of the main places, and we'll probably have done so, but like robot probes is going to be the majority of what we send out in the next century yeah in a thousand i think we'll have basically taken the million plants the solar system all those little minor plants a thousand years from now everyone will them be owned and we'll have some community on it whether it's someone's individual mansion or a you know a new york size city right yeah a million wards in this system alone Wow. A thousand years from now. Yeah, that's a cool. That's a cool <laughs> thought. That's a really cool thought. And then, what about the big speculation with the hundred thousand? Although for your channel, that's kind of not that big. Speculation, oh, that's, that's I guess. Talking, yeah, yeah. A <laughs> hundred thousand years now is the most optimistic scenario for having colonized the entire galaxy, as that requires near light speed. Uh, but realistically, a hundred thousand years from now, we'd probably have gotten a few thousand light years out from Earth. We'd probably still be in a roughly spherical element because the galactic disk is pretty pretty wide. So until you get out to three, four, five thousand 5,000 light years away from us, you'd still be doing a sphere of expansion rather than a big disk. And I think we'd probably have one that was a few thousand light years across that was very heavily populated and probably no star was visible inside it. You'd probably just see big infrared blobs of all these globe Dyson swarms. But 
which again are not that tightly packed. It's just a kind of an effect of having a lot of people living there. Yeah. Um, and so I would guess the human population 100,000 years from now would be um, a billion, billion, billion people. I'm going to go with that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> and we'll, we'll be a, basically a type three well we could be a type three civilization then you think yeah like, we'd be uh, we'd be uh, close we'd still yeah. have a couple orders of magic to get there but that i would close, say by the yeah. year one million ad that's by the year one million ad there would not be a star in this galaxy that doesn't have human colonization completely around it yeah. other than maybe a few weird nature bazaars and uh, i would say you probably would not see any more stars forming naturally anymore either they'd all be yeah. kind of controlled Wow. So maybe in a hundred thousand will be like what, like a two point five or two point two point four. Something along those lines. Those yeah. logarithmic scales are hard to work out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean I'm not gonna hold myself to my number. I mean I I'm just <laughs> But um okay, so so this question, I've kind of planned out a little scenario mm-hmm. question for you. After this one we'll go to kind of quick fire uh to, to take us mostly to the end. Um, but this one, I want you to kind of have a little bit of freedom, take five, 10 minutes I, longer if you want. But again, I'm going to have to rush us after that. Um, let's say it's the year 2500 or there or thereabouts. Um, we humans are now interstellar. We just discovered our first planet with primitive life on it, primitive intelligent life. And um, kind of, I'm not going to specify the exact level, but they're not, you know, they're not, they're not human intelligence. They're, they're, you know, take, make, make of it what you will. Yeah. Kind <laughs> yeah. of that, that kind of vibe. Yeah. No technology. Um, so considering how we treat our planet and the life on our planet, it's easy to imagine, in my opinion, that we would basically take whatever we wanted in terms of resources or do whatever we want with pretty much no regard for the life there. I'm sure the masses wouldn't be happy with that, but we wouldn't necessarily get told the true story, right? Same as when we would go to a, you know, an unexplored country back in the day, I imagine. Um, it would kind of be like Avatar. I imagine the intentions, the human intentions would play out similar to that. But let's take that scenario, rewind it to just when we first discovered that planet and realized it had this kind of life. Um, you're in charge. How do you handle that situation short term and long term? Hmm. I mean, if you actually found a planet like that, you're going to be spending centuries just cataloging all the biological data. And that, that's the key thing. When you find a, a planet that's actually got life on it. The valuable thing on that planet is life. There, there's no unobtainium in the universe that's unique to some planet. You might find a relatively young one that was only a billion years old that was ridiculously high in like uranium isotopes that were valuable, but even then, not that much. And uh, it's going to be hard to mine in asteroids. There's not going to be much life there a billion years in. And I'll, I'll be honest, I don't care about pond scum living on like a, a lake surface. You take samples of it because that's valuable stuff. You see what it's made out of. And then you, you got the samples. You can go in a petri dish. They don't need a planet anymore. You find complex animal life, though. That's the valuable thing on that planet. So, mm-hmm. ironically, you want to do it very carefully. Not just for biological, but for anthropological purposes. Say, so, well, you know, we really give a whole plan over the idea of anthropological study. Say, so, well, let's let's put this in scale. A Dyson swarm or Carl Shift two civilization has one solar system that outnumbers our current population a billion to one. That's what these things look like. So they could have an entire planet that was one anthropology department. You know, for anything that you've got one person of here on this planet, they've got one of in that. You know, one mm-hmm. planet of in that in terms of population. So. Let's say you have 1,000 exoplanet astronomers today. That same single system, Kardashev II civilization, would have 700 billion of them full time. And, and it would be a small percentage of the population just like now. So you find that one planet that just has primitive aliens on it and life forms, maybe you've got entire planets worth of scientists who want nothing more than to study the pristine planet and sample it. That's the value of the thing, right? They don't have to mine out for gold. That that's not that valuable. There's nothing on that planet other than its life, its culture, its art that's going to be of value. And you could probably fund the entire mission just off some tiny little bracket like, we want to study their cave art. Because that's, you know, again, could you find 100 people who are willing to chip in a uh, 1000 bucks to study cave art these days? Sure. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Then you'd have a trillion then. So could you, with a $1,000 trillion dollars, fund a mission there of course you could right that's the that's the thing about these scales is you're not going there to go steal their impossible material right you go there and get a sample if they got it you know and then you go replicate it you know if you've got a play out like dune that's got this spice on it it's not that you're going there with all resources to get that material you're putting all your effort into figuring out how to mass produce it why because you're greedy 
right? And if you're greedy, you don't want one planet producing the spice or the unobtainium. You want five million of them. <laughs> so, and while you're busy exploring for that purpose, all your focus is just on studying it. And to study something properly means not damage yet yeah. in the process if you can avoid it. So ironically, any civilization that is probably safe for us because you know those natives are more valuable to us as themselves than anything they're living on top of you know uh because again you could raise so much money from a k2 civilization just for the purpose of that one documentary study in their lifetimes whatever yeah. it was that's the focus there um and that's the key always with everything involving you know the future in terms of these things is the scale right uh the other thing to keep in mind is you know we, we so often tend to view these things as them and us you know us and one other alien species is coming to wipe us out or whatever it is, or us and the core, you know, the mega core or government. It's never one actor and another actor. It's entire ecosystem of players. Mm. And so people who are not necessarily very ethical themselves suddenly find their morality because the opposition they want to toss out is doing something that some people think is a war as their chance to go, ah. <laughs> so I don't think that would change the future. So PR is a big thing for corporations and nations nowadays and for, you know, nonprofit groups even. It's not likely to change in the future. Video cameras exist. They're going to get better in the future. In a civilization where people can post from Facebook a thousand light years away, even if it takes a thousand light years to get there, people are going to wonder, hey, what's going on on that planet? You know, and they're going to know what people's ability to deep fake technology is too. So it pays when the, the light is shining down on you to act in a way according to the idea that people are watching you. Mm -hmm. So ironically, I think we actually have fairly ethical interactions with primitive aliens in the future. <laughs> how, would, how would you start it? If, if you were in charge and you just wanted to say, yeah, study the life there and you wanted to learn as much as you could about it, what would be the first move and, and yeah, the second move and that kind of stuff? I'm really interested to... That is a hard one because on, on the one hand, you know, part of me says that, that the first thing to do is to study it a lot with like tiny little robots. You, you send in like a board sized drone that just watches them, learns their language and stuff like that. And you find out where the intelligent ones are at and, and you mostly stay away from there because they might live in some area the size of France and, and your entire plant to go mess around out that they're nowhere near. You shouldn't have any problem hiding. You know, you land your spaceships on the other side of the planet or at nighttime, whatever it is. Uh, they don't see you. Um, and there's a lot to be said about that. But there's the other side that says, if these are people, and that's the only thing that all these people are not, and the answer is yes, they are people, then they deserve all the same kind of respect that you give anybody else. Primitive isn't the same as stupid. And so you have to say, how long can I spy on these people? Because that's what I'm doing. Yeah. Spying on them. Right? Before I certainly have kind of a, a more requirement to go in and say hello. Right? And I think you know, if people miss this so much, something like the, the Federation Prime Directive, once you meet somebody that's in the, you know, that kind of state, you don't get to dictate that relationship anymore, not if you're acting ethically. So when they say things like, we would love for you to have this technology that you have, you need a really good reason not to say, okay. Because they say, we, we would love to have, you know, you, you tell us there are no plagues or illnesses. We would love for you to teach us how to do that. We would love to teach you. Yeah, yeah. that's, that's, we had to say, no, we don't think you're ready for that yet. Say, well, how, <laughs> how many people have to die before we're ready? Just out of curiosity. How, what, did you invent this technology yourself, by the way? How did you, you know, like your civilization is ready for, yes, well, we discovered it. As I understand it, like one or two of your smart guys who, who aren't really all that ethical themselves, just really smart, they discovered it and you yeah. use it. You know, so when a lot of those cases say, I think that while there's a case to be made for studying the heck out of it before you make contact, I think ethically you, you have a requirement to learn the basics before you go in and say hello. There's nothing wrong with trying to, you know, well, there's not say nothing wrong. The lesser evil is to try to get enough of the basic custom and language down that you're not likely to cause a permanent wound. And then you have to say, look, we've been watching you for a while. We thought it was time to come and say hi. We're sorry for eavesdropping on you like that. But, you know, as you probably know, as a social species, sometimes things can go very wrong uh, when you meet somebody you don't have a base with. And uh, they're like, say, well, thank you for not spying us any longer than you had to. We're glad to meet your acquaintance. You know, you got the technological edge. You need to come in there speaking their language and not doing things like waving a gun around because that's what your culture says is the good way to say hello. Look, I'm armed, and now you know. You know that don't terrify the natives, and I think that justifies a little bit of spine. But it is still, it is 
not really ethical to spy on anybody like that. You know, it, it, if it's not right to do to a human, then it's not right to do to an intelligent alien either, I should think. So, yeah. And, yeah. you know, we, we traditionally make contact with people and it by, it, we don't usually actually have fighting between two new groups when they first meet. They usually are cautiously friendly. Mm. You know, so to say, the worst fights are between people who know each other well. Civil wars the worst kind. Usually with strangers, there's not enough time to have built up that level of animosity yet. So I think that if we try to be respectful and we work from the assumption that, you know, always say, well, what would I like people to do to me? You know, treat others as you would be treated yourself. That's probably your best bet. At the very least, if an intergalactic war breaks out because of something like that, you say, hey, look, we really tried to do the right thing here. You know? <laughs> We got it wrong, we got it wrong, we can go to all graves knowing we acted ethically. And I would say, on a whole, you're just likely to have it happen if you were trying to act unethically, too. So, always, boys, I think Warren Buffett said, um, always choose to travel the higher road. If, for one thing, it tends to be so infrequently traveled, there's not a lot of people on the way to slow you down. Yeah. Yeah, okay. I mean, I guess as well, the observation period, like that could vary massively depending on yeah. yeah how how much you understand and how easy. I mean, they might, depending on how different they are as well, right? How different I think they are that, to us. I think I, I'd have a suspicion you have a competing desire by people to like, well, we've learned enough, let's go talk to them. Mm. But given who you likely have studying them, they're always going to be, I think, prone to, well, just a little bit more. And the longer you've been doing it, you know, the, the, are we ready yet? And this is their professional reputation on the line. This is the future of history of the relations. I think that you'd have tendency for people to uh, wait longer than they should, in which case it probably is good to say, look, remember, um, you are watching these people. You are spying on them. You are yeah. sampling them. Uh, patience is a virtue only to a point. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so. Yeah, I agree. I mean, it's such a fascinating kind of thing to to ponder. I, I love to think about that. But obviously, again, it could play out any number of a billion ways, a trillion ways, <laughs> depending oh. on what kind of civilization they are. And, and People yeah. often worry we're going to have an end of privacy in the next century or so. And mm. We'll probably have a change dynamic because it's different than it was a century ago, too. You know, what's private now isn't necessarily what was private a century ago. And there are things yeah. that up and down. It could be two centuries from now. Everyone's so used to living on camera, you know, that they wouldn't even like, well, of course we record them. Any civilized, you know, civilization would know there was no problem being recorded all the time, mm. you know. Uh, but you know that that could be how another civilization looks at that comes and visits us too. Uh, I value my privacy though, so I'm going to extend that to the when I encounter as well. Yeah, so. yeah, me too. I respect that. That's nice. And again, I think we would have to. That would be an interesting conversation at some point. Is yeah, that they would have the same rights as us and that kind of thing. Which again, I agree with you. Um, if we were um, like observing this this planet and the, these life forms on there and say they haven't got technology like we said and then we we notice an asteroid coming towards their planet and we had the ability to de deflect or destroy said asteroid would we do it i i suppose we would but we, would yeah. you do it i well that's a tricky one i don't believe we have a, an absolute requirement to do things like that people say well you have a responsibility or a duty to do x y or z say so, i don't know if i'd say that you know but if i'm walking by you know it's the good samaritan principle if you're walking by somebody who is who is gasping and about to die I, you're not a mortal if you walk past them but i don't know what you are but it's not somebody who i'd want to get to know very well mm. you, you you stop and help them out if someone's got an asteroid hurtling towards their planet and you can stop it uh, and it's not going to be like something that bankrupts your entire planet to do it. You know, it's not that hard for you to blow the thing up. You do it. Right. Yeah. And obviously there's, there's a lot of gray zones in there, but you know, well, you stopped an asteroid. What about a plague? I'm fine with that too. Yeah. I, I don't see any particular advantage of them dying in droves. Yeah. Uh, well, okay. What about a civil war? Well, yeah, there's a great episode of Star Trek that covers that. So now we'll get a little, right. little less certain pen pals, great Star Trek, the next generation episode. We kind of talks about that, but um, it's a good thing to remember how much the prime directive mutated during Star Trek's run too, and with good cause, depending on the right or the circumstance. It is a hard issue. Yeah. You should never be too casual about screwing with other people's business. Um, on the other hand, I cannot find any ethical basis for saying, well, it was their natural fate to be hit by a, a rock. <laughs> yeah. And, yeah. Uh, I, I don't think that's probably true you know? yeah no i agree I and agree. if it's not i i you know then obviously if things are that predestined then if i help them out that was predestined too yeah, um yeah. but no, I, yeah it's i agree i'd say the one thing on that is is the tricky part is 
we have kind of a, um, I'm probably going to phrase this badly, philosophically, we have a notion of basic human rights, and then what I'll, for the moment, call citizens' rights, you know, the ones that, like, I live in the United States, so I'm entitled to certain things as a citizen versus I'm a human being. I get those too, right? You have a right not to be shot by a random person, period. Mm -hmm. And that should apply to aliens or uplifted chimpanzees and dogs or whatever it is. It's just things that you just don't, you know, do. Um, yeah. Versus things that might be more specific, like I have the right to free bus fare inside the city as a taxpayer of the city, you know, something yeah. like that. Yeah. And that's still a very new area for us to kind of flush out what qualifies a human right versus, again, a citizen right in that case, or a positive and negative rights, as sometimes we get called. Um, I think anything that we think of as a fundamental human right that we give to any human regardless whether they're a citizen of an area, that almost has to apply to an alien. And in a case like that, I would say, I don't have a responsibility to go help out in Myanmar if they get hit by a hurricane or, or uh, some other natural disaster or an asteroid. But I cannot imagine telling somebody you were wrong to do so. Mm. Yeah, you know, that's basically the notion of if we let this asteroid hit the planet, because it's not like we individually would have to say, "Well, we're going to do this." You have a giant interstellar civilization. Someone's going to go ahead and do a telethon for, like, "Hey, let's save the Zebulon folks from that asteroid hitting them." Who is willing to chip a couple hundred bucks in to blow that asteroid up? And in a civilization that size, I think you're going to have no problem doing it. So the question becomes. Are you willing to actually shoot at people to prevent them from blowing up that asteroid? Yeah. And I think that's that definitely is, you know, on, on one side or another that more event horizon. So yeah. Got you. Let's jump into this quick fire round, Isaac, because I'm I don't I, we, we're t our time is running out here, so I just want to get to a few more things. Um, so yeah, bear in mind, try and keep these to, I guess. I'll try to keep these to a sentence or two. <laughs> like, like some of them less than a minute. This first one, you can try and keep it to like a word or two, because it really is that simple, this one. Um, well, it's not simple, it's, it's, <laughs> but you know what I'm saying. Um, so faster than light travel. Is there a zero or non-zero chance that this will one day be a possibility? Non-zero, but close to zero, I think. <laughs> but non-zero, that's what I, that's the bold. <laughs> I had Avi Loeb uh, last time, he said the same thing, so you're in good company. Mm. Um, when will our first manned interstellar mission occur? Manned interstellar mission, I think it would launch this in the next hundred years. Yeah, okay. And do you think, again, this one was probably going to take too long, but just, I guess, again, in, in a very kind of couple of words, Torpor, would you think that's something that we would use maybe to, 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 to do interstellar? I think that's something you might use on interplanetary journeys. I don't think you'd ever use that on interstellar ship because the life support differences are not that big between the two. You. What you need to just keep a community going versus that. Got you. Maybe, maybe, maybe with Pluto. cyborgs. The more transhumanist population might, might use options like that more. Got you. Okay. Um, I, I was going to ask you your thoughts on Breakthrough Starshot, but maybe that's kind of hard to do in, in a couple of words. I had occasion to meet and talk to Pete Warden about three months back in Santa Monica, and I was already a big fan of that, and I always have been a big fan of laser pushing me before Breakthrough Starshot was a thing, uh, officially anyway. Uh, I love that idea. He and I had some wonderful conversations about that at the Japanese consulate, actually. So yeah. uh, wow. looking at it more, and that man is wonderful to listen to. He's infinitely full of stories, though, great. So, yeah so just excited about it basically project, yeah. um again this one would have been one i would have liked to have heard your thoughts in more detail on but it will in the interest of rattling through dark forest theory i have an episode on dark forest theory uh yeah. you know it's it's a it's not a good for me paradox solution but we go through <laughs> it in detail they are worse ones but it, it they, they had some core flaws i will i will link all of your these episodes that you mentioned as well <laughs> and i'll try and link them all in the description um but yeah so so you think we should be sending stuff out or not I think it doesn't make a difference if you do or not. You know, you yeah. can pick up a habitable planet with James Webb. So yeah. if yeah. this planet's been visible by that for a billion years or more, uh, yeah. what do you think the odds are a technological civilization uh, doesn't know we already exist who have you. you know, proximity to us? Got you. They know we're here. Yeah, no, that's <laughs> fair enough. Um, when will we develop a fully transmedium craft? Trans. Transmedium. So like a craft that is able to, to, to go oh, from AOC, space underwater. Extra. Yeah, sea space, yeah. I hope in my lifetime. I, I would love to have that kind of classic, you know, um, classic, you know, sci-fi ship that can go yeah. up and down. I just finished watching the Futurama episode with my wife. She'd never seen them before where they uh, had the spaceship get pulled underwater by a giant fish. And they say, uh, you know, Professor, how many atmospheres can the ship withstand of pressure? And he says, well, since it's a spaceship, somewhere between zero and one. Now passing 200 atmospheres of pressure. <laughs> so I would yeah. love to uh, have that ship. But I think that's... 
that could be something in the next century or so. It just depends yeah. on how well we have things like modular or um, smart matter or things like that. It's yeah. it's it's doable. Whether or not you would do it, you know. How that to say. Would, it would be super cool. Um, will will we ever be UFOs for another civilization? And and if so, do you want to have a completely random guess as to when <laughs> a century? Um, <laughs> within the next ten thousand years, I think that assuming that we don't blow ourselves to smithereens in a complete fashion that obliterates us totally, you're going to end up with some space colonies that are a lot further out initially than they should have been. Mm. You know, they don't go with the main way; they pushed ahead. And then they're going to have at least a few of those that were like, we got away because we wanted to have a more primitive or simple lifetime or something along those lines. You got billions of settling colonial, you know, colonial fleets. At least a few of those are going to decide to go space Amish in the war. And then yeah. we're going to show up there and be like, oh, okay, all these aliens, all these humans, like, they might look <laughs> really different after a few, you know. Yeah. We got genetic engineering to play. You might come across a planet of centaurs who all breathe all gone and be like, what is this? <laughs> so... <laughs> I think that you know, even as soon as ten thousand years, you'd have incidents like that, or like yeah. an Omeo Soto that would decide to be in the Oort cloud, and it's like we were sealing ourselves up for all time so we can experiment in our existence as super chimps or whatever it is, and then yeah. they've forgotten who they are, and you crack that Omeo Soto open and go peek inside, and you're like, wow, there's life still in here, but that <laughs> takes time. Yeah. You have an amazing brain. These are all so much fun to, to think about. Um, this question is going to be a short question, but my background info that I'm going to read to you is probably the longest I've ever done for this podcast. So bear with me for just a couple of minutes. In 2020, you published a video giving your thoughts on the three famous Navy UAP videos. Since then, there's been an Office of the Director of National Intelligence report released in 2021. Here are a couple of quotes from said report. So this is a brief quote. Some UAP appeared to remain stationary in Windsor Loft, move against the wind, maneuver abruptly, or move at considerable speed without discernible means of propulsion. In a small number of cases, military aircraft systems processed radio frequency energy associated with UAP sightings. We are conducting further analysis to determine if breakthrough technologies were demonstrated. That's the end of the quote, but I'll carry on my, my background there. Recently, there has also, also been the first open congressional hearing on the subject in over 50 years, and they have confirmed that they've received hundreds more reports since June 2021. NASA has also now just confirmed that they're joining the search for this understanding, just as Harvard's Avi Loeb's Galileo project is doing. Former presidents are saying publicly that there are things in our skies that we do not know what they are. Countless former military and intelligence officials have gone on the record to say that there is something to it and that it is compartmentalized and covered up. The former head of the government's Advanced Aerospace Threat Identification Program, Luis Elizondo, has strongly alluded to the fact that these are intelligently controlled craft that defy our known laws of physics, and we have no reason to think that they are ours and allies or an adversaries. There is, by nature, a chance that in our galaxy there's a civilization that has, say, a 100 million year head start on us, or even a 500,000 year head start. Of all the millions of UFO sightings, starting long before we even had the ability to fly basic planes, some by experts, some caught on camera and radar, and some, no doubt, before we had the capability to record such things, do you think that even just one was a craft constructed or controlled by a non-human intelligence? No. <laughs> well, I, I, it comes I down to feeling. this. We're not seeing new evidence, really, right? Um, there, there's some critical points on this to kind of close out on. As I said earlier, People had a tendency, especially in the scientific community, if you brought the word aliens to get all nervous, has an, oh, I don't believe in that. That was bad science on their part. Right? That's, that was, I won't say cowardly because, you know, they don't want to gamble their professional reputation. Fair enough. Right? The answer should have always been, um, if I were an alien and had arisen 100 million years ago, I would absolutely go visit a planet. So mm -hmm. I always look from the perspective, Earth is not, you know, boring space Kansas to be avoided and Kansas gets millions of visitors every year. If there are aliens out here, they are going to come visit. Some of them are going to come visit. We have people who study ants for a living and love them. They're going to come visit us, yeah. right? Um, if they, so I assume that they don't exist, otherwise they'd be here, right? And that's, it's one of those two to me. It's, it's either they don't exist nearby or they come visit. That's yeah. all I can imagine. That yeah. said, people you know, got to understand there's nothing new here in terms of reactions, People are just willing to actually say it now who were embarrassed to say, well, there might be aliens before because they were waiting to get laughed off stage. Other things to keep in mind, I'm ex-military and I've flown planes. Right? I've also driven cars for years. If I see some weird animal run across the road just because I've been a car pilot my whole life, doesn't mean I have a magical ability to know anything special about how the proportion of that animal works. All right? That's not how that works. And I don't want to bang on any of those pilots. I don't think they were lying. 
maybe a few here and there. Most sightings, the person's being as honest as they can be, right? Nor are they incompetent, but you don't gain a magical ability to figure out how fast a ship is going from a few seconds of camera footage either. People say, well, what do you think it is? Say, I have no idea. I don't know what it is. I can't tell from this picture. Could it be aliens? It could be magma men from underneath the continent. I don't know. We don't have enough evidence to say. Could it be aliens? Yeah, of course it could be. But let's not just jump there immediately like that because some folks are saying, I don't know how this worked. It doesn't matter that military pilots saw things acting really over quarter them. The recordings are not sufficient to tell people this was an alien. As to whether or not it's one of ours, let's say it was one of ours. Like a ranch the government says, well, we're going to test out our nuclear submarines that are supposed to be really good at hiding and their new drones. What should we test them on? I know the most advanced detection system available, that carrier fleet over there. Should we tell them that's what it was? No. But, hey, should we tell Congress what it was? I suppose if we have to, if they asked, was it you? You know, we have compartmentalization so often in these things. Yeah, we yeah. don't know whose it was. We don't know there was anything interesting. And in some cases, it really could be, I hate I know people hate this, it could be a weather balloon. You know, at least in the one case, I think it was four, it looks like a weather balloon. It acts exactly like one. Right? So maybe that's what it was, this thing that it, it looks exactly like. But as the others, I don't know. There's a lot, it could be any number of weird phenomena we don't know about yet. But the biggest takeaways are one, Export witnesses are like every other eyewitness on the planet, bad witnesses. Two, instrumentation is good if you have good resolution. Three, I'm really glad people have learned to not be afraid to say it could be aliens, because it could be. That yeah. could be exactly yeah. what it is. I appreciate but the real difference that. is just that people are willing to publicly discuss it now. Congress isn't afraid they're going to get kicked out of you know, office by, yeah. like with Dennis Kucinich, people would say that they, they believed in aliens. Yeah. That was a congressman. They made fun of for years for that. Yeah. So I'm glad that people are courageous enough to see what they think it might be. Yeah, I don't and, agree what it is, though. <laughs> and that's fair enough that you don't agree, but I respect that you that you admit that, yeah, it could be, and we don't know what it is. Um, yeah. To be honest, when I initially wrote that question out, I, I had, do you think it could be? And I knew you'd answer yes to that, but I had to change it to, you. do, do you oh, think yeah. one was? Um, so but that's fine. I expected aliens, the yeah, no. <laughs> yeah, no, that's something. fair enough. I mean, all I'll say in response is, do you think kind of NASA and the governments have kind of lost their minds? Do you think, or do you think these things are worthy of research? Do you think that we need to study this and find out what I, my it is? Biggest is really that instead of having become less cowardly about William willing to just say it could be aliens, that they maybe decide that that they dare not say it couldn't be aliens too, because that that's how government bureaucracy generally tend to work. At the moment, mm. it seems absurd to look at those and not say, "Oh no, that is absolutely natural," because mm. they, they they don't really look like it to people, whether they yeah. are or not. They don't look like it. Yeah. Uh, the answer is whatever the science. Uh, well, the truth is whatever the truth actually is. Yeah, and the scientific way is told me that is not to jump on fads. Just because in the past it was unpopular to say it might be aliens and now it's okay, doesn't mean it was then, no, it is now, or wasn't back then. Yeah. We could be visited, and if they're all alien civilizations in this galaxy that are more than us and capable of space travel, yeah, they've been here. You know, yeah. Or their hyper-intelligent probes been here. And maybe that was one of them. That but, was going to be one of my next questions, actually. Like, yeah. if, if you think that there's, if we've ever been observed by an ET civilization, um, like uh, either by a telescope, by a probe, or, you know, something along those lines. If they're in this galaxy and they've been around that long, then yes. Yeah. Um, if, if for the way then that, that, that starts getting a little bit trickier because you probably couldn't tell if a planet was habitable from another galaxy away. You yeah. probably would have to wait for signals. So again, a big speculation here, but again, yes or no, do you think anyone or anything knows we're here? If they exist, they do. I mean, again, they, 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 if if civilizations blow themselves up before they get to the ability to detect, you know, things a little bit better than James Webb Telescope as their options, then no. Uh, or yeah. if they just don't come up very often, then no. If yeah. they're around, then they do. Yeah. Right. Same it's as we're going to know if there's anybody who's got a habitable planet that's an oxygen-rich atmosphere in this galaxy, in the next couple thousand years, we'll know every single one of those isn't blocked by the zone of avoidance in the zone yeah. of galaxy. And we'll know yeah. the close ones, hopefully pretty soon. So I yeah. guess a nice way to wrap that up is just to say that I suppose you, just like most people, are very excited to see what Avi's project, Galileo project, is going to turn up, what's going to come from, from all this study and, and, mm -hmm. how it's, and the James <laughs> Webb and how this is all going to unfold. I don't agree with him about a Moo Moo, for instance, but I am really glad that he was only just say that because he's a respected scientist in any means that way. People say, well, do you agree with him? I was like, no. Do you think he's crazy? No. Yeah. He's brilliant. <laughs> Those two are, mind you, not mutually exclusive, but yeah. he's, he's, we're allowed to disagree on stuff scientifically. Yeah. And he doesn't I, present crazy arguments. They're solid. I just don't agree with them. 
Yeah. And I think partly on that, I think partly my, in my opinion, at least, I think maybe he just kind of wanted to put it out there to say that it could be and that we need to, in science, accept that it could be. And it needs to be a kind of taken into consideration and not just dismissed out of hand. And and I think it's had the desired effect, if that was his goal, to kind of change the way it, things are talked about and looked at. Because at and least now it's... His goal is to, all I know is he's a good scientist. And yeah. He, but the thing is, between poo-pooing everything with extreme skepticism and jumping on every new bit of potential phenomena, there's a responsible zone that people should aim for. Uh, but not everyone's going to be on the same page about what qualifies well. We just as a civilization need to keep the general attitude of, I, I don't like the idea of skepticism in the sense of trying to be like, oh, there's no such thing as ghosts. Uh, I don't happen to think they're all ghosts, but I think it might be kind of cool if they were. So mm-hmm. I want to approach the phenomenon assumption of this could be a cool thing if true, and it's something worth investigating, but I'm going to investigate on the assumption that it might not be true. Yeah. You know, and I'm not aiming to figure out if it's true. You know, I'm not trying to decide in advance what it's going to be. At least I hope I'm not. Yeah. And then I want to find out what is actually true. Yeah. Yeah. We need to remove the preconceived biases and science needs to be open-minded and follow the science. Like we say, follow the evidence. We do a pretty good job for what as human beings go, you know, scientists Mm. are as human beings as everybody else. And they jump on wagons. They shouldn't while others are too cautious, too skeptical too uh, you know, and and it's not like they do. It's like someone one or the other. We're all like that. It's like I say about um, the Donald Kruger effect, the idea that sometimes people's, um, you know, competence level, is very inverse to their actual uh, level of confidence, right? Yeah. They can be very confident in something they know very little about, then it dips down and rises back up each lower and more. They call that first peak where you don't know that much but think you do, the peak of Mount Stupid. And say, well, some people like to, you know, are definitely there and say, no, it's not that some people are definitely on the peak of Mount Stupid. Everybody likes to go camping there. It's just some <laughs> people, some people, it's a once a year visit, other people have like a, a you know, a permanent cabin. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> On that note, I, sh- I should let you get going, Isaac, but I really, really appreciate your time today. It was This was so much fun. Well, thank you so much for having me on, man. No, no, my pleasure. My pleasure. Thank you for listening to my conversation with the one and only Isaac Arthur. I hope you enjoyed it and learned something along the way. Please check out the description for links to Isaac's channel, videos, and to learn more about him. If you want to join us on our journey as we try to unravel the universe, please subscribe.